This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, have you got yourself your PR Podcast plug yet? We've had a few people send in some PR Podcast plugs, but we want more. Um, and the PR Podcast plug we created um, from the, the, uh, the joke that at least that I tell about myself, that uh, as PR people, we're great at promoting our clients and horrible at promoting ourselves. So this is a way for you to promote yourself, to tell us something cool that you're doing. Um, Maybe it's a new uh, app that you've built. Maybe it's a cool TikTok channel that you have. Maybe it's something really neat that you either have done or achieved or think or you know want to showcase. Send us an email or reach out on one of the social media platforms um, and send us your PR podcast plug, and we will plug you at the top of an upcoming episode. Now let's get right into our show for today. <laughs> Bonnie Taylor is partner and chief communications and strategy officer at Talent Resources, a former TR client on the agency side for Duncan. Bonnie joined TR in 2020 and created the agency's highly successful communications team, which is composed of industry veterans in key locations across the country. Bonnie is responsible for bringing in high profile clients like the Athlete's Foot, Jordan Skinny Mixes, Oza and was instrumental in the Ben Affleck and Duncan collaboration. Love that one. Bonnie continues to lead the, the development and execution of communications and strategic initiatives across her extensive experience in public relations and marketing and has been an invaluable asset in growing all divisions. Bonnie, welcome to the PR podcast. Thank you for having me. We hey. just found out connecting here that you and I grew up like 10 minutes from each other. Probably not we, even. <laughs> That is just and just bonkers to me how you know it's like you go you go halfway around the globe and you meet people who are on vacation that are next door to you, just crazy. Without giving it away, I can't believe that we we literally grew up ten minutes from each other. Uh, absolutely, still. I mean, it's literally like a stone's throw. I feel like everything in my life I could pull out of my mom's development. And I was in your town. Uh. <laughs> and we could we could do an hour on this place and that place, but we won't bore people. Um, <laughs> tell us about your work. Um, with talent resources. Yeah. So I actually started as, as my bio. So I, I was working at an agency and Duncan was my client. We were the, you know, global agency of record. And I would call, call talent resources when I needed a celebrity or an influencer. And our CEO, Mike jokes all the time that I was the toughest client they ever had because I knew exactly what I wanted. I was sticking to the budget. I knew the PR angles, all my extensions, everything that was going to come out of it. And I was just very aggressive because I have this, these kind of, my team will tell you, I come up with crazy ideas and it's like, let's do it. We're going to make this happen. So after, oh my gosh, five years of going, I, I went and met with Matt, our other partners, our president and Mike, our CEO, and, and kind of walked out with a job, thought I was going for strategic planning. And I was the first out of New York hire. So it was one of those things. This was January, right before the pandemic. Uh, a month later, I found myself at Super Bowl Miami, helping run carpet, running the event. And, and then we came back, we moved offices and the world shut down. And since then, our PR division has really just boomed because I saw what was happening at not only my previous agency, but through friends connected, you know, been in this business a long time and saw that, you know, it was either hey, our staff has to keep their salaries or we're going to force clients to pay retainers. And there was so much uncertainty that I wanted to almost flip the script and do a different model where I wasn't going to lock people into these 12-month retainers. It was, hey, listen, we're going to be here when you need us. Is it three months to get through the hump to figure out a project? Are you relaunching a website? Are you re-strategizing? And from that kind of strategy and our team of, of venture as well, where you know we we work on sweat equity for some clients. So like Oza, who you mentioned, we took that on as one of our first sweat equity deals. So really to be a strategic marketing and PR partner more than anything else, because we've been in the shoes. Um, we have grown. My team has nine people across the country, which are all amazing and continuing to expand every day. And we're we're not pigeonholed into specific verticals. So we have somebody, you know, we have experts across fashion, lifestyle, CPG, movies you know, all of these startups, technology, and it's been great to see how we all kind of collaborate together, but then we're also able to use all the other extensions and services of our talent resources team 
our agency was founded as an influencer agency. So a lot of times our team will come in with a brand deal with a celebrity and then we're brought in on a project basis to amplify that. Let's place the photos. Let's see how much we can write out of this. What can we do? So it's really been fun to kind of navigate these last two to three years and see where we are now. And it's just been crazy, crazy fun ride. Talk about being the client and then moving over and going with the agency. I mean, I've I've been on both sides. I've been in-house, I've been an agency. And I've also, when I've been in-house, I've had agencies working for me. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic, but but tell us your experience. What's that like sort of being the client? Yeah, so I was the agency side of Duncan, but I think if you asked anybody, they would tell you they thought I worked at Duncan because I was at the office every day. I still text the team almost every day. I'm very close with people there. So it was one of those things where I knew, I think it's helping me now more than anything else. I know what their schedule is like. I know what their turnaround time is like. You know, working with a, a client like Duncan is really like working with 25 clients. You have all different brand managers, brand teams, local markets. You know, when I was there, we had like 40 local agencies underneath us. And now I think they've streamlined it and tightened it up a little bit. But it's really because you have it's all franchisees you're representing and they're controlling your marketing dollars. And, you know, you really want to make them proud and get them excited about a program. So for me coming in on this side, it's it's almost helped because I can force out on going, hey, this is going to be a um a landmark on a calendar. This is going to happen every year. We need to prep for this. We need to be prepared for this, not just for, for Duncan, but for all of our clients. We know what's really important, like the back to school pillars, the holiday, the strategic times. Um, but our client Jordan Skinny Mixes, which the irony is, is I've used their product for God know how many years I've been obsessed and I connected with their CMO in a Facebook group and it almost pivoted right away. And it was like, Hey, I have the foundational knowledge of how Duncan's marketing calendar works in your key times. And they're like, well, we're putting out pumpkin. We're putting out all of these flavors too, and being able to be strategic. So it's been great to take that almost institutional knowledge I've gotten and now to apply it to everybody else, but also to motivate some of our other teams, like our talent team saying, Hey, listen, these campaigns are coming up. These key times of the year are coming up. Let's prep for it. Let's get out there and let's get ahead of it. That's got to be a little bit like herding cats, though. I mean, if you've got lots of different play people in lots of different places with lots of different ways of thinking about how they're owning their own marketing, but yet you're trying to get them to march in a, in a similar direction. Do you have any tips or tricks on how you do that? Yeah, I think it's really being a true partner and listening more than anything else and figuring out from day one, what are the goals and objectives? Who are your target audience? Because a lot of times my favorite thing about climate, like, my target audience is everyone. And I was like, well, it's actually not. Let's be realistic. You know, we hear that all the time. And it's like, yes, we want to be everywhere. It's like, we no, everywhere. We don't. Yeah. And we want to market to everyone, which is totally fine. But at the end of the day, who's actually buying? Who, where is your conversion coming? Is it the mom who's out there shopping? Is it, you know, like, what is that audience? We found most kids products. You want to market to mom because she's doing the grocery shopping. She's going to put, it. and I always say, I'm usually the target demo. I, I'm early forties, mom of two, two young boys. I get it in Massachusetts. Like I get served all these ads and from competitor clients all the time, just because I get it. I'm that audience, but I also will. And you know, if you can ask anybody, my team, even the interns, I'm questioning them. If they're the target audience for a potential client or customer, I want to know what they think about. Who are they following on social? What magazines or online pubs? What are they reading? Where are they getting their information from? Because we have to go to who that audience is to make an impact. Yeah, that is so true. And, and I have those similar conversations with people about um, one, you know, the wanting to be everywhere, um, which I which I liken also to like, I want to be on the front page of the New York Times. And the, it's like, why? What do you think that's going to do for you? And and how is that going to drive your business goal forward? Because really, that's I think that's the trick in PR. And I want to hear your, your thoughts on this, is adjusting people's expectations away from the ego-driven, I want to be in fill-in-the-blank media outlet, to I want to do the media work that's going to drive my business. How do you, how do you sort of get them to focus on that? Yeah. So when I started, I mean... And it's the photocopy and clip books, right? Like we had one client who we had to deliver the hardbound clip book. And it was like, if he didn't get that thud on the table, he was going to be very upset, right? So you're that, like, is the, oh. that is the old school ROI, man. That thud, yeah. there was nothing better. 
Yeah. And you're there copying and binding and, and going through all these things. And it was like, oh my God, okay, what's the clipbook going to look like this month? And now it's like, we're sending grids and recaps and we're designing them in Canva with our graphic arts team, but like, and they're beautiful. But I think it's really reinforcing the mentality that post COVID we're watching publications shut down left and right. You're not getting the same ROI that you were getting, you know, even five years ago out of an article. I think, you know, just recently as the ESPYs, I was with talent and, you know, I saw an article that said the ESPYs probably had 4 million viewers tune in for the show. This person who was there based on our relationship that I walked on the carpet and with her team and she did three TikToks that averaged 40 million impressions. And it was going, well, wait a minute, here's one of your big broadcasts. Do you do an ad with that? And you're only getting 4 million viewers or do you pay this influencer potentially and you've got 40 million. So I think it's really training our clients that the impressions are coming from everywhere. And what are those conversions? Yes, we need to make sure we're still covering the B2B. We're making sure that the, you know, we need to be seen in those weeklies. We need to be seen. And it's always great, but a lot of them are becoming paid opportunities. And so that's the hard part too of like even Forbes, you know, we're getting addressed and it's like, oh, it's Forbes council. And you're going, well, wait a minute. So you're paying to push this article. That's not the traditional Forbes. It's probably not going to show up in book. It's probably not going to show up here. You're going to have to bury to find it. So I think it's really training our clients about where the organic and earned impressions are coming from that can genuinely move the needle for you. So that's why I always suggest the seeding, the gifting, like we want to get product into people's hands so they like it. But I also will go to media and just introduce my clients and say, listen, if you're ever writing a story, I have these experts for you. You, They can view a quote because yes, that impression is still going to count. You're still going to link to their website. Um, was it two years ago in the height of the pandemic, the glass shortage and the shipping delays and the shipping containers that were stuck in Long Beach? One of our clients was a glassware company. And I said, listen, you need to talk about this, your glass shortage. What is this meaning for your production? What are these holdups, your shipping delays and this? And then they became this vocal advocate that nobody would have thought about their industry because they were cannabis affiliated glassware, but they're talking mainstream USA Today news because this is a global impact. So true, so true. And a great point going back to what you, you said about the influencer versus the ad. Um, and if you're paying one versus paying the other, you know, tapping into not only a larger market, but the right market. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I've always been a believer that, that paid and organic complement each other. Done right, they complement each other. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're almost seeing a shift away from traditional, what I'll call traditional advertising, into more creative influencer-based advertising, which also, frankly, is more of the fishing where your fish are. More of the targeting the people you actually want to be getting to. Yeah. We study their, their backgrounds. We're studying who is their audience? What is their sales conversions? Where are they actually making a difference and driving the needle? And that's why we go, you know, when we're submitting any talent for any of our brands, we're like, Hey, we're data driven because yes, I, my favorite thing is a talent manager because we're brokers, right? So we're agnostic. We can work with absolutely anybody. We don't have a roster. We're going to be putting down people's faces then I get a talent manager sending me a roster. You need to work with this person. They're a huge fan of the brand. I'm like, if they were a huge fan of the brand, why am I not seeing any of the products in their last six Instagram posts in their feed or on their stories? I said, you're out to make a buck. So let's, let's separate that because that's always my number one thing is we'll take all your inquiries. We're going to do a deep dive to see if they are a fit. But the analytics, like, oh, millions of followers, millions of followers. I was like, well, let's look, you're like 3% bots. So your millions of followers have now just been cut down and your engagement rate is this. Like we set these thresholds for brands to engage with because they genuinely, if you're going to spend money, we want that impact. We want to see the ROI come through. It's the same thing. Influencers are the new advertising. It's how are you tracking? How are you tracking conversions though? I mean, I, you, what you described was the vanity metrics, right? Which is yep. fine. There, there is some value to it, but the real value, like you said, is the conversions. How are you doing that? We're looking at actual sales data. So basically on the backlinks, everything that we're providing them, unique UTM codes, same thing as when we would do for pitching for a story for holiday roundups, right? We're put, providing unique UTMs because we want to see who's actually clicking from these publications. Or my favorite is if it gets syndicated, 
you know, where's the traffic coming from? Was this worth our time? So we know back, you know, good looking back holiday next year, don't waste your time on this article. It really yielded nothing or they're only wanting Amazon affiliates. So then you have to have your Amazon tracking code. We need to know what's going, what's posting and when that's coming. So we're very much on actual, like we're looking at genuine sales data. That's what I wanted to get at because I think a lot of, and especially small businesses um, don't understand this is that there is so much that needs to get done on the back end to set this up to be able to track these conversions. You can't just go out, throw money at an influencer and expect people to beat a door, to, uh, beat a, 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 a line to your cash register. It's not going to work because you're not, like you said, you're not going to be able to tell where the traffic is coming from. Yeah. And even if you're whitelisting, right? I think that all clients should put money aside for whitelisting their posts because Instagram algorithms, I feel like they change every other day and you want to make sure you're actually, their audience is going to see that post. So the only way to guarantee it is to earmark a small budget for whitelisting, which could drive up your influencer rate. We know that. We know that they don't love that, but those extra dollars are going to guarantee you more impressions and potentially more conversion. It is, is it as simple as setting up a specific link or code that an influencer uses, or is it more involved than that? I think it's, it's definitely more involved. The unique links and codes really depend on, are they signing on as an affiliate, right? Are they making extra money or commission on that backend side? So that has to be determined. If they're not, there is separating, like, here's the link that we want you to post in your stories and share and drive traffic from. From the whitelisting, you have to have your, you know, your Facebook business side and everything, the pages, they have to accept you as an authorized business, giving you, you know, approvals to boost their content. So whitelisting is boosting the influencer's content from your paid brand account. So interesting, really interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it, there's a lot that goes into working with an influencer that is, like we said, that's on the back end that before you even reach out to say, would you like to represent our brand or, you know, use our product or whatever, you got to set a lot of stuff up because if you can't track it, you can't know if it's being affected. Absolutely. And are they, are they good? Like, right. You do a program. Do you want to extend the life of it? Do you want the usage? So for us, it's, we want to take that photo. We're also going to pitch it and put it in traditional earned media as well of this person as an ambassador. Is it a lifestyle image or whatnot? Or is it a scene from them using it in an event, whatever it may be. But I think there's, you really have to look at it as a 360 when that's an ambassador for your, your company now. That is another spokesperson for your organization. So are you getting everything you possibly can out of them? And that's what I say. Like, we need to look at it as 360. It's not just somebody smiling and posting, you know, your product on their page. There has to be more. A lot of times, you know, I always say I will not work with any talent that is not a true, authentic fan of the brand. Because I had a really, you know, we had a really bad experience on the Duncan side years ago with an athlete who didn't drink coffee and showed up on set and wouldn't drink coffee. So you have to go, okay, wait a minute now. Let's say, what do they actually love? What are they promoting? And does it resonate? Because I think as an audience and all of us follow, I mean, we all go down these TikTok rabbit holes every night. We're engaged with the content and we can tell what's real and what they genuinely like versus what's fake. We know right away. You can tell how they're talking about it, how they engage, are they using it, or are they just unboxing and onto the next? So I think it's your audience is a lot smarter now than they've ever been before. And that sounds to me that that uh, what you're describing there sounds to me like the start of a potential PR crisis as well. You know, the person who doesn't actually use the product is being disingenuous in promoting the product. And then that gets out and suddenly it's a story about how this person is full of it. The brand is full of it, it you know, and it just goes down, downhill from there. It's a agree? cash grab. That's all they're in for it. They're in for the dollars. Yeah. And, and it's hard to recover. A brand has a really tough time recovering from bad press like that. Yeah. And, but on the flip side, you have to hold these ambassadors to a higher level of, of accountability. So when things do happen with them in their personal life, they need to understand there's going to be repercussions and they may be dropped. So it's like, you can't bank on them that they are the end all be all until that post is lot. Like until you have completely crossed the finish line, the campaign is wrapped. 
that's what I was saying. Like you were always on high alert. You never know. I said with all these NBA players and all the controversy that was coming out, I feel like sports is always a difficult one to navigate, but also celebrities and influencers being put in difficult situations are unique or having, you know, election time of the year is always crazy because you don't know who's going to be overly political, who's not. And some brands say, Hey, we're staying out of politics completely. So I think over as we get ready for 2024 programming, knowing we're coming into election cycles, people are definitely going to be looking at things. People are going to be like, oh, well, wait a minute. What do I have here? Should I be using this? Is this the right person? Or the person we thought was great six months ago, maybe they've changed. Maybe their audience has changed based on you know one post. And that can be challenging. I got to imagine that can be challenging. I mean, because those kinds of things, even though the, the campaigns get planned a year in advance, the details of the individual, the influencer, their behavior, what have you, can turn, like you said, can turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. Everything's happening in real time. And that's Amazing. why we always say we're super high alert that even if our clients aren't using our PR services, our PR team is watching everything because we want to make sure that any brands or companies associated with talent resources, we're looking out for them. Boy, the things that people don't know about what we do, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell us a little... <laughs> Tell us a little story about the Ben Affleck and the Duncan collaboration, because I I love uh, I, I love when those kind of authentic feeling things happen. Give us a little get a little backstory there. Set it up um, for us, and then tell us how you're involved. Yeah, so I feel like it's been three or four years in the making. Um, we've tried year. So for us, we always knew Ben, hometown guy, loves his Duncan, obviously photographed everywhere. Paparazzi always has a Duncan in his hand. And it was one of those things where it's like, how do we capitalize it? What do we maximize? So there was, you know, the talks on just the social play and things happening. Well, Ben doesn't have social media. So we have to talk about there. So it's, you can't just pay somebody that way. Um, about a year and a half ago, we had a potential product to bring to his team just to even see, hey, would you be interested in this? And I think the dollars were never spot on because somebody to have that profile and that cachet, who you have to look at it, he really doesn't do a lot of endorsement deals. So it was the persistence. And then finally, um, my awesome friend on the, on the Duncan Market team, she goes, I think we have it. And I think we're good. And I think we're ready to pull the trigger and go bigger than we've ever thought before. From the timing of her saying that, I would say within two weeks, I was on a Zoom with Ben and his entire team and the Duncan team talking about this. Um, probably record speed. Like that's how we were the talent brokers. So we brokered the deal between Ben and Duncan. We brought him to the table, had everything set up with his management team. And I luckily enough got to be on, on set for the commercial shoot. It was awesome. Um Ben's mom was in the trailer, which was super fun to meet her. Did We didn't know that Jennifer was coming until it was Jennifer's bringing Ben lunch. And then the, the coolest thing happened. It was our CEO is very good friends with Benny Medina and called Benny and said, listen, we have this opportunity for Jennifer to be involved in this. And um, for a very, very, very late night, made it happen. And we were able to close Jennifer that night. And then you saw content, what you saw. Um, so I would say like my first Super Bowl commercial to be a part of, we were out at Super Bowl. We were, you know, throwing the Rolling Stone event and to be able to watch that was absolutely the most surreal kind of experience of my career. That's very fun. cool. That's very cool to hear. And those are, those are fun stories to be able to, things to go through, right. As a, as a PR person, as a talent person um, to be able to ride that process through, to be able to be there when it happens um, and to have that story to tell for the rest of your life is very cool. Is it, is it that easy? Uh, easy. I, I don't mean to use that word. Is it that simple? I guess that, you know, you come up with ideas, you come up with ideas and you just come up with the one that sticks and the talent goes, yep, that's the one. Is it that straightforward? Like, is it that simple and compartmentalized? So it's, it's a combination because, you know, a client like a Duncan or other ones we've worked with, there's several agencies. So sometimes there's the creative agency, there's the ad agency, there's the PR agency. So you've got have to jive. Um, somebody like Ben and then another celebrity that I cannot talk about yet because we're still negotiating the contract, but they want to be hands-on. And we're finding that more and more that they really want to be involved in the creative process, in creating the narrative. 
they want to know what they're going to be saying. They don't want to just come in and read a script and take their paycheck and leave. Like they're really taking ownership of it, which I think was so exciting for all of us to see with Ben. Like, you know, his new company, Artist Equity, played a huge role. Like that's who was on set, really. They were, you know, shooting. Ben was doing the editing himself, which was one of the coolest things to find. You're like, hey, I have this footage. Let's do this. Um, but we're seeing that more and more that the talent really wants to, hey, listen, this is an extension of me. I'm going to be involved. I need to be involved in more of the bigger picture. So we can come up with a hundred ideas and maybe it'll lead to something else. I think on that Zoom call, it was, do we shoot this in California? Do we shoot this in bot? Like, where do we go? And it was, hey, no, we have to go to hometown. We need to go, you know, back to my roots. And that's how it ended up. And it all happened so fast. But it was one of those things that it's, it's a pattern that we're seeing more and more of. They need to feel authentic about it, which is great. It's not somebody who's in it for the cash grab. They're in it for, hey, we genuinely need to make an impact with this content. That's so interesting. And so maybe to close out the idea here, if do you have any advice for people um, or, or brands or companies or whoever it is who want to go down this road, either maybe not working with someone like a Ben Affleck, but someone who is an influencer or, or who is influential, who can bring cachet to their brand or some kind of benefit to their brand, how should people start to think about it and begin to go about it? I think that the number one thing I tell everybody is creativity is key, right? You don't, and don't come in with the perception of, well, we just want to create content that's going to go viral. You don't know what's going to go viral. Get the viral word out of your head create impactful content that is going to move the needle for your business. And if it happens to take off, that's fantastic. But don't come in and, and I'll never, you know, uh, we've been on so many new business calls and like, well, I just want something that's going to go viral. And I was like, don't we all? Don't we all? And I think that's the thing of, I rather say, I want content for you that you're, you're proud of, you're proud to push out on other channels and mediums. You're proud to tell the story for PR, for earned media for it. But it's not just something that the whole goal is to create this crazy viral video. It's just not worth it. So sounds to me like what you're talking about is, is being authentic. Always. Authenticity is key. And knowing who you are and knowing your brand values and knowing your ethos and knowing your audience and what resonates. That's, that's what's impactful. That's why advertising is so successful when it's done right. And I think all of us have seen some commercials and we're like, oh, really? Like even Super Bowl commercials are a great thing because people spend so much money, so much time trying to be creative. And how many times we walk away and we're like, oh, that didn't, I don't get it. That missed the mark. That wasn't real. What happened? Um, and then you see something that does resonate and you're like, oh, wow. I should have thought of that. I couldn't believe I didn't think about that sooner. <laughs> well, it, it, you're clearly very good at what you do and, and you've dropped a lot of terrific uh, knowledge and points here. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Yeah, I love it. I say we're in a fun industry, right? Like we are not sitting behind a desk and and I'm not a banker. I'm not one of these people that's like, oh, I have to, I'm so excited to go to work. I think the energy that comes out from our teams and just people in the industry, like marketing is fun. And at the end of the day, like we get to have fun for a living. We're not doing things that are stuffy, but I love creating a new project. I love being on site for an event, like the rush of that and getting the media to show up and getting the stories afterwards. Like that is it's like having more children for me, right? Like I love it. I thrive on the chaos. Um, I have a sign on my desk that says chaos coordinator because everybody knows like, I just love it. I'd rather be involved and immersed in all the nonstop fun versus just sitting there and, and paper, you know, pushing paper. So great. So great. And it sounds like you're a lot of fun to work with too. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to segue now into the rapid fire question portion of our podcast. Speaking of fun, uh, okay. Here's where we steal a page from inside the actor's studio. Ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions meant to elicit a simple answer, maybe a laugh or two. Bonnie Taylor, rapid fire question number one for you. What's your favorite news source? Ooh, Instagram. Everybody's right. on Instagram. Rapid fire question. Yep. Everybody's on Instagram, right? Are you on threads yet? I am on threads. Well, we okay. have a whole thing but going. How are you finding it? How are you finding it? I like it better than Twitter. I will say that people are more real. And it's less political right now, which I'm very much enjoying. Yeah, right. Okay, now, I have a little political bug in me, but the the, the toxicity of Twitter was getting old. Same. I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agreed. Agreed. Rapid fire question number two, and maybe you'll change your answer to rapid fire question number one. What's your favorite social media platform? 
Oh, sell Instagram. I'm a big Instagram user. Absolutely love, love it. Love the pictures. Rapid fire question number three, coffee or alcohol? Okay, I, it's both because I'm an iced coffee girl year round. I will have pumpkin iced coffee year round, but anybody on my team knows they, I am a huge fan of um, tequila. All so, right. All right. Oh, yeah. I, I saw I saw a TikTok a little uh, while back. Everyone's probably seen this. Uh, the advice for being on a Zoom call, if you blow on your wine during the Zoom call, everyone will think it's coffee. hundred percent. Except for my whole team. That. I prefer shots of tequila so I don't have to hold anything. Uh. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid fire question number four. What's your favorite on the run food? Ooh. Um, Dunkin' Wake Up Wraps. Mm, good stuff. Rapid fire question number five. What do you want to be after you finish this career? So hard because being a mom, I am such a sports mom. I'm a sports junkie. Uh, I always said that my dream job, had I not landed where I were, was to do PR for the New York Jets. I'm a diehard Jet fan. So I'm sorry. Life. I know <laughs> JT has just ended the season, but maybe we have a little comeback now. Um, but yeah, like my whole, as something in sports, if I had to go. Good stuff. Bonnie, this has been a great conversation. Please let people know how they can find you online. Absolutely. So um, any of we're at Talent Resources on all of our channels. Um, my Instagram is Bonnie Taylor, T-A-Y-L-A, -A, kind of a nod to my husband who's from Maine and all the Mainers, how they pronounce Taylor. Um, but you can find Bonnie Taylor pretty much anywhere. LinkedIn, please connect with me. Um, also through our, our Talent Resources website. Sounds good. Thanks again, Bonnie. And thank you everyone for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the PR podcast and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Appolt. You can find him in his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast.